Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 4, Procurement and Supply. This is Module 7, Whole Life Asset Management, and we're going to look at Learning Outcome 1, which is to understand the methods of storage and movement of inventory. So we're going to look at the principles, the purpose and the impact of stores and warehouse design. Explain the use of product coding and then contrast the impact of using different warehousing equipment. So in relation to warehousing, organisations must make decisions about things like the volume of stock they're required to use immediately, appropriate timescales for making stock available, and the lead times in the supply chain. When assessing warehousing and stock locations, you should consider things like the cost of the location, the availability and stability of the building, the nature of the items being stored, access to transport infrastructure, including ports, inland waterways, roads, as well as our customers and suppliers. The current requirement, facilities and performance, and as well as the future needs, which is based on projections and the development of an organisation. Now, costs associated with warehouse options, if you look at the graph on the left hand side, it covers things like the cost of running the warehouse, the total cost of stock holding, and stock management increases as there are more warehouses. The transport costs is the total cost of transport, which will decrease when there are more warehouses. But the total cost of running will look at both of those things added together. So why does the total cost of running a warehouse increase as there are more warehouses? And why does the total cost of transport decrease as there are more warehouses? So in this case, which option represents the whole lowest total cost? So it's actually at two warehouses because I guess the more warehouses you have, the closer you are to your customers, which would bring the transport costs down. But then you've got the operating costs, which will go up. So the staffing, the land, the rent. So what this actually looks at is at what point can I have the minimal total cost? And that to me looks like two warehouses. In terms of warehouse options, you can have a single floor layout, which makes use of the full height available. And you can use things like racking or multi-floor layouts, which maximize the use of available land. The multi-floor layouts has full stock weight loading. So the equipment and the weight and the racking all needs to be considered, plus access to the additional floors. So here are some of the aspects that need to be taken into account when designing your warehouse building. The temperature that you require for the stock. So some stock reacts really badly to direct sunlight and may require a specific temperature of storage. Whether heavy lift cranes are required? If so, they need to be integrated into the infrastructure of the building. The sizing and position of any external or internal doors. That's in relation to getting goods in and out of the building. The number and position of delivery bays, which will be determined by the volume and size of deliveries expected. So if you look at the diagrams on here, it just shows you how adjusting the design of the docks can enable more docks to be created. We do need to think about health and safety regulations, like zoning for the warehouse, particularly when forklift trucks are operating, and space allocation for storage and movement of the goods in the stockyard. And then you've got the security and safety of your staff and assets within the warehouse and in the stockyard. When determining the layout of your stores and warehouse, you're going to need to consider things like items that need that are needed for immediate use. Position high use items at the point of entry or exit to reduce time and labour which can be saved as a result of distance traveled in the warehouse. But also think about the size, shape, weight and volume of the stock. The storage requirements in terms of temperature and light levels. 
and the method palettes, tote boxes and cardboard boxes. Other aspects that should be considered are the type of equipment that, ha that has to be required for stock handling. The space required for storage, so does the stock have a level or seasonal demand? The amount of space required for other operations such as inbound and outbound goods areas, staffing areas, parking, and parking your stock handling equipment as well as waste. And the future plans of the organisation and how they might impact storage requirements. Now most warehouse systems today are set up using either a through flow of products or an I or U flow strategy. U flows are the most commonly used setups. The same end of the facility can take care of both shipping and receiving. So it looks a little bit like a horseshoe. So the U-Flow warehouse system, goods can flow from each, from, sorry, from receiving to storing and then to shipping in a smooth and orderly fashion. And only one dock is needed as both shipping and receiving can share the same area. An L-Flow or an I-Flow system is quite different. Shipping is located at one end of the facility, while the other of receiving is somewhere else. Goods travel from one end of the building to the other, and shipping and receiving are separate. Even though there are obvious disadvantages, there can be benefits with the use of um, a flow through warehouse, including the fact that goods are able to move fast um, and they can be stored in the centre of the building for better efficiency. And when shipping and receiving vehicles are different, there are no need to share a common dock. Now flow, space, utilisation and flexibility is an essential aspect of warehouse design. The flow of goods must be considered from the initial arrival to the final exit. And to this end, the design of the warehouse must encompass the mass and velocity of the goods moving through that facility. A smooth flow may be accomplished by considering docks, doors and devices or equipment to unload and load from the point of delivery to the point of dispatch. Um, now FIFO or LIFO stands for first in first out or last in first out. First in first out is a type of inventory management that allows inventory placed in a rack system first to be removed. So the FIFO rack systems are ideal for customers requiring rapid stock rotation, having a high turnover rate for inventory or storing items with expiration dates. So imagine going into a McDonald's or a Burger King they're going to use a FIFO method, first in, first out. LIFO, last in, first out, is a type of inventory management system that allows inventory placed in the rack last to be removed first. So the last in, first out storage is most often used when goods have a long shelf life or those held in large quantities. And the layout of these systems will have a direct impact on the facility's design. Cubic capacity is an essential measure of net storage space available in a warehouse. It can be calculated by multiplying the floor space area with the average height of the stack. And the average stacking height depends upon facilities like floor load criteria, safety regulations and facility designs. Cubic capacity can also be calculated for bins and racks. It's important um, to optimise the cubic capacity to maximise the use of space available for storage. It may not be feasible to use the complete space available in a warehouse for practical reasons such as size differences, stacking problems, height or aisle widths. So in order to find the efficiency capacity utilisation of the warehouse it can be calculated based on occupied cubic feet divided it by cubic capacity. Now, based on cubic capacity and utilisation, it may be decided that the aisle width used is not efficient enough. This may give rise to using of narrow aisle racking. Now, switching to narrow aisle racking or very narrow aisle racking 
allows companies to store more goods and materials per square foot within their warehouse. But this involves narrowing the aisles as well as going higher with your pallet racking to allow maximum storage. Standard selective pallet racking aisles are at least 12 foot wide, but narrow aisle racking can be, be, be between eight and 10, and very, na very narrow can be as narrow as five and a half foot, storing up to 50% more products in the same footprint. But using narrow aisle racking will require specialist equipment that can be used in narrow aisles. And you'll require the replacement of forklift trucks with something known as a reach truck, which will have a small turning circle. Other options would be the use of flexible warehousing by using random storage systems or temporary storage. Common usage of product codes. And they're used for things like identifying specific products. They often link uh, to internal processes such as triggering an out of stock warning of potential volume errors or general picking lists in a warehouse. They can be used by organisations within supply chain to reduce the risk of ordering and delivering the wrong item. It can be created by each organisation in a format that's useful, either useful to them or their customers. And in some industries, they use um, industry standards like ISBNs on books. Can be numerical, alphabetical or alphanumeric. They may be randomly generated, sequential or structured. But they often have integrated check digits, which are additional numbers or characters added to the code that a computer system uses to verify that the number is valid. And can sometimes be used alongside a stock keeping unit or a SKU. So have a think about the uh, product codes that you use in your business. What format is it? Is it alpha, numeric, or a bit of both? What is the code formed of? Do different sections provide different pieces of information? Do you use SKUs in addition to product codes? And how are codes linked to your internal systems? Now item codes are used to simply identify items that are carried in inventory using numbers or letters. And some organizations will call them part numbers, model numbers, product codes. But whatever you call them, item codes are important for the organization and the systems they use. If the system cannot uniquely identify an item, it can effectively account for it, it cannot effectively account for its activity and whereabouts within your inventory. Item codes also serve as a shorthand for long descriptions and a check digit, as we said, is often used. The last digit of a barcode number is a computer check which makes sure the barcode has been completely composed. So as well as the advantages of identification, barcodes eliminate human error reduce the need for training on descriptions and provide a versatile identification system for rapid, accurate data and improved decision makings. So the benefits are, they identified individual products, groups, content of purchase orders, batch numbers, even the producer and the routing for delivery. Some even go as far as identifying the dates of production and the sell by date unique items, as well as the arrival and departure. And an order tracking system is one that tracks goods from the moment the order is placed to when they're physically delivered to the destination. RFID is radio frequency identification. And it refers to technology where digital data is encoded in an RFID tag, which is captured by a reader via radio waves. RFID is similar to barcodes in that data on the tag and label are captured by a device that stores the data in a database. However, there are several advantages over this system than the use of barcodes. The most notable is that the RFID tag can be read outside the line of sight, whereas barcodes must be aligned with an optical scanner. RFID belongs to a group of technologies referred to as automatic identification and data capture. 
and these methods automatically identify objects, collect data about them and enter those directly into your computer with little or no human intervention. Materials handling equipment encompasses a range of tools, vehicles, appliances and accessories involved in transporting, storing, controlling and protecting products at any stage of goods flow. Industrial trucks refer to the different kind of transport items and vehicles used to move the materials and products. These transport devices can include small hand operator trucks, pallet jacks and various kinds of grab and drum lifters. The decision as to the equipment to be used will be based on size, weight and distance to be travelled. So here are some of the examples of the material handling equipment used in warehouses. Dollies, trolleys, roll cages, pickers, pallet trucks and forklift trucks, vacuum lifters, conveyors, cranes and carousels. Operators and staff should be trained in the safe operation of the equipment to, to avoid any hazards. And operating conditions such as the maximum dimensions and weights need to be observed. Equipment that can be used for other purpose, things, things like compressing waste to take less space while being stored, or weighing goods to reduce the likelihood of theft. Checking dimensions and volumes. Installing storage racking to maximise the use of space. So we touched briefly on forklift trucks and reach trucks earlier when we discussed the racking. A counterbalance forklift truck is the most common type of truck around a warehouse and represents um, an image that most people instinctively think of when we imagine a forklift. The forks stick out the front of the vehicle and there are no protruding arms or legs meaning the truck can be manoeuvred right up close to the racking of the location. No reach facility is necessary and the truck operates in a relatively straightforward fashion. Reach trucks offer maximum height with incredible manoeuvrability and for those reasons they're best suited to warehouse operations. The name takes the influence from the machine's ability to reach out further than its stabilizing legs. This makes it incredibly easy to reach into racking and allows the truck to lift up at great heights in a very tight working environment. The stabilizing legs and batteries with the reach truck also eradicate the need for a counterweight. And then a pallet, which is a flat structure that's used for shipping and transport. Pallets allow commercial goods and shipping containers to be shipped in a stable form by giving them support so they can be lifted by the pallet trucks, the forklifts and other devices. Furthermore, pallets allow for efficiencies in storage and handling. Most pallets are made of wood, but there are also some that are made of plastic, metal, paper and recycled materials. Pallets can have a two-way entry or a four-way entry. The two-way entry means that the the pallet truck can only go in front or back, whereas a four-way entry can go in front, back or either side. And the Euro pallet is a standard European pallet as specified by the European Pallet Association. Now pallet racking is a material handle storage system designed to store materials on pallets. And although there are many varieties of pallet racking, all types allow for the storage of palletization materials in horizontal rows with multiple levels. And shelving can be used for smaller items. The cantilever racking is a storage system designed to store long, awkward and bulky materials of virtual, virtually any length. Unlike any other racking system, cantilever racks offer no vertical obstruction in the storage area. Power mobile racking is an electric powered racking storage bank involving a framed motor base with wheels that move along floor rails and you press a button or a remote control providing increased cubic capacity. And then live pallet racking is used for the FIFO system first in first out. 
So your loading area is at the opposite end of the unloading area. And the goods are moving along the space on an inclined roller bed. So as I said, like McDonald's, when they're putting burgers at the back and they're rolling forward, but they'll, they'll take out the oldest one first. A unit load could buy its items or an item in shipping containers into a single unit that can be moved easily with a pallet, jack or a forklift truck. So in this example, you've got paper clips in a box, box go into a larger box, an operational unit, which then goes onto layers and layers on pond layers becomes a whole pallet unit load. But why do we need packaging? What's it used for? Well, ask yourself this question. How could you get toothpaste to a consumer without using a tube? Why does it come in a box? Is that needed? The objective of packet, packing and packaging is to protect the product from damage in transit. To protect the products from being damaged by the product itself. To protect the handler of the product from harm to comply with transport and legal requirements or to meet an organization's image and marketing objective, to meet the organization's environmental commitment and to meet a cost target in order to maintain profitability. Packaging requires for a product depending on the nature of the product, its size, weight and relative fragility. And void filling is inserting materials to fill the space that is left after the products are in the box so they don't move around as much. We see this quite a lot with Amazon deliveries. And the packaging ability is to move the product and the environmental impacts that should be considered before implementation. And labeling on the packing should use things like the handling instructions, any safety symbols, specific hazardous good, goods labeling together with UN codes for transportation of hazardous goods. And goods for import and export may need specific wrapping and packaging and outer boxes or pallets will need to be labelled for customs clearance and documents by showing the harmonious item description and coding system. Environmental cost of materials will include the use, energy use in production, the carbon footprint of its journey from raw material to manufacture to the end user. Reuse, return, recycling of disposal. They all have additional costs. Environmental standards for packaging may widely vary from country to country. Many regulations relate mainly in the safety of the public and some relate much more to the disposal implications. But some regulations use taxes to discourage use. But some countries do not invest in reuse or recycling schemes or encourage more use of less harmful packaging. But the diversity guidelines and regulations and standards means that tracking a product and its packaging through the supply chain becomes an important part of considering the packaging to be used. Supply chains may implement packaging standards that meet the local requirements of one country but exceed the requirements in another. It's more likely that a supply chain can meet more requirements if the standard adopted meets trading block or regional standards, or even an international standard that's adopted by lots of countries. So the ISO standard related to packaging and the environment were published in 2013, which helps to reduce environmental impact, support innovation in products, packaging and the supply chain, avoid undue restrictions in the use of packaging and prevent barriers and restrictions to trade. Now warehouse automation is widely seen as one of the most effective ways to boost return on investment by reducing labour demands, enhancing accuracy and improving efficiency. Warehouse automation is one area where long-term costs can be significantly reduced but some think of warehouse autom automation as software, others think about it as an idea of automating a warehouse and implementing automated storage and retrieval systems. In reality, complete warehouse automation entails automating a variety of aspects of operation, such as data capture to software, 
to storage, retrieval and more. That's the end of Learning Outcome 1. Thank you for watching.